It's Radio 1. It's two and a half minutes past two, and that means it's the Irish Collection with Alf McCarthy. Good morning to you, and welcome to the programme. Thank you to Michael Murphy for late news, and to Maxi for the late time gardening hints on late dates. Maxi, as she's already mentioned, back again tonight at 11 o'clock. And how are you this morning? Our telephone number, 1850-888-999. Just the cost of a local call wherever you are in the country. And if you're outside the country, it's 353-21-805-853. And on this morning's program, in the light of recent orphanage scandals, apparently thousands of orphans were sent out of the country in the 50s and the 60s. A pint of plain may be your only man, but Sean Penn is not to be the bowl Brendan Bean. Sir Cliff Richard snubs one of his subjects, uh, sorry, fans, former fan, that is. The Heineken Hot Press Awards, multiple sclerosis, a look at teenage life in Dublin from a first-time novelist. And the cornucopia, that is, Mondays, 702. 1850-888-999. Now, a lot of activity within the hallowed halls of the Football Association of Ireland in the past week, culminating in a rash of resignations last night. But as jo John told Marion Finucane on Lifeline, we need more information before we rush to judgment. My, my own experience of, of um, Joe Delaney in particular was, was uh, I, I thought he was a great guy. Um, Mind you, I went to the World Cup with my family and 200 of us, 200 people over there were stranded and um, the, the, the travel agent went bust, it was on TV and so on. That's right, we covered uh, it here too at the time, yeah? Yeah, and Joe Delaney came up and um, at short notice got us tickets for the games. Yes, because the prospect at the time was, I mean, there was problem over the hotel accommodation, uh, they, they had but there was a question about flights and so on and so forth but uh, presumably if you were there the main thing was to get to the match and sort out the other problems later oh that's it yeah I mean we're going to be locked out of our rooms and so on so uh, if, you, if you're stranded over there with three children um, it's a very traumatic and difficult time I can well believe and, it uh, you know Joe Delaney was, was there till all hours at night chasing around getting us tickets and, and um, I think his heart's in the right place you know he, he, yeah. he supported us and in times of need like that I think we we, uh, we appreciated the t 200 people over where, there Where you know? did he get the tickets? Because at the time we were all told the tickets were like gold dust Well, well that's right um, I, I don't know maybe he went out and trawled the streets or, or maybe he talked to all the George the Greeks whoever it might be <laughs> but uh, obviously you can appreciate we, we, we weren't too fussy where he got them we were just so delighted he got them Yeah um, And did he succeed in getting them for everyone, do you know? He's certainly got them for you and your children. But yes, he, well, he got them for everyone. The, Did the he? first game, um, he, you know, he, he wasn't there. We, we just got to the hotel, and the following day we realised we hadn't got enough tickets. We had some tickets for the first game, but not enough for everyone. Yeah. And we had a, we had a, a lottery for tickets. It was, I tell you, <laughs> the most traumatic time of my life. You know, you're standing there in, in, in New York, New Jersey airport, and uh, you're waiting for your name to be called to see if you got a ticket to the Italian game. And luckily enough, three three of us, myself and two of my children, got tickets. And um, how many of your children were with you? Three. Ooh, and my, my what oldest, happened to the third? Well, my oldest boy didn't get the ticket, and uh, he was in tears. And uh, I just gave my ticket to him, and he brought the two younger, the twelve and fourteen year old, and and other people said they would take the, the kids along, and they brought them to the match. And about I suppose eighty of us went over to the local hotel. But it was a terrible time. Oh, I mean, that was a heartbreak. Uh, well, was a oh, that's heartbreak. a heartbreak. Because you're 200 people there waiting, waiting for a draw. They, they decided they'd draw the names for the 120 tickets there were. And uh, 80 people weren't going to get tickets. And, I mean, there was a man from Cork. He'd first holiday in seven years running his own business with a 12-year-old kid. Totally distraught. Oh. And then for the next two games, Joe got the tickets. So... Obviously, I think he's a great guy. <laughs> I, can, I can well understand. Can I just ask you, because I'm interested in these things, what age were your three? Uh, I had a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 20-year-old. Oh, right, so the 20-year-old is well able to bring the other two. He was, yeah. yeah. yeah he was weren't, weren't you the lucky guy that you got three out of the it, house? Indeed, yeah, indeed. We, we, were, we were really delighted, praying candles a lot, you know. Right. But, uh, again, so, I mean, I appreciate, Marion, that... Uh, I, I think we can be very harsh with people in sport, particularly people perhaps coming from, you know, an amateur background where they got involved in the sport, 
uh, you know they're, they're helping to run a league they perhaps don't have training or experience of, of running a huge organisation like the FAI Well and, it turned uh, overnight really from a small outfit to a multi-million pound outfit Absolutely Absolutely, I, I think that that's the problem. And uh, you know, back in the, the mid '80s, they couldn't they couldn't give tickets away, and, yeah. and uh, it wasn't a problem. Whereas, I mean, sponsorship, big multinationals came in. Um, you know, a, a lot of marketing expertise was required, and, and these people who'd given a lot of their own personal time uh, for nothing uh, were, were kind of sucked into a, a large organisation, and perhaps. You know, it just got too much for them. Right. And I think we could be a bit too harsh in, in judging. Um, I mean, some of the stories in the media and... and uh, yeah, let's, yeah, well, it might be, as you, as you say, that the thing grew quicker than the expertise that went along with it. But presumably at this stage, they're going to have to sort it out on a professional basis. Oh, I think so. I think the only answer is to get in the, the management consultants and uh, to get the, the proper people... In, in, in place to, to, you know, who have the expertise. As I say, I, in, in, in respect to Joe, and I, I don't know a great deal about any, any of the other people, but yeah. I think, that, you know, that, that their heart is in football, they're, they're football fans and supporters. Uh, you know, these people have probably given a lot of their, their, as I say, their free time over the years, and okay, they've made a mistake. Uh, it's an area where they didn't have a great deal of expertise, perhaps, and, and, and were really kind of being very harsh and, and some nasty stories going around which are all rumour and, and innuendo right, and so right. on. You know. Okay, right John, thank okay, you Marianne. for that, all okay. the best. Bye bye and next we come back to Dublin. Robert, good afternoon to you. Um, hello Marianne. Sir. Now you've taken a different view on this. Oh, a complete different view. Um, I, I think the, the chap has been ra rather generous, you know. Um, even like uh, be before you come on, we had on the news uh, there's Casey's revelation that uh, each council member uh, received approximately 200 tickets per international. Well he, well, he certainly said that he did. I well, don't know he if he did, said well, they all did. Well, I imagine uh, they would all be in the same position, but um, I, I think that's possibly where uh, the, the trouble stemmed from even last year when we derived in Lansdowne Road uh, tickets fell into the wrong hands, and it's quite obvious that um, tickets of, of that amount had to come from um, a source like that, you know. Um, into but, I mean, there's no way of knowing. I, I thought that it had been clarified that the tickets that were given to the thugs in, that came over uh, were given to them through the through the FA in Britain. No, no, sure. The FA in Britain weren't issued any tickets. We did. That was a compromise before the game was even played, uh, that there would be no tickets issued. And uh, that is how these uh, guys got held, uh, hold of these tickets is really... Uh, beyond all feeling like and that like disregarding the, the havoc that uh, caused like uh, also the game being abandoned and yeah. like and if there had been any decency at all um, people who with stubs or remainder like they, they should have really had their money refunded and um, I think uh, that's really where the uh, the, the line w was drawn then, you know, that's really what uh, cocked an awful lot of ears, you know, that there seemed to be problems uh, arising fr from even back then, you know. Yeah, you I heard John Connolly on, on it, uh, talking about it actually just quite recently. You believe that whoever um, paid for that match that didn't happen uh, should should have got their money back? Well, definitely. Uh, like, there are an awful lot of people have, have taken civil actions, uh, obviously through injuries they've received and that, you know. Uh, that's just one issue. Like, we also have... Uh, they, we, we spoke there, I, I remember the last qualifying game for Ireland in 1988, which was against Bulgaria, it was a game in which, which Liam Brady was sent off, and you could actually go into Lansdowne Road and pick a seat, you know, there was yes. about 10,000 people there, yeah. um, and then it all stemmed after that when, you know, we had the goal for Scotland, and then we qualified for Europe and so forth, but um, it, it got so big then, like the person who created all that was, you might say, Jack Charlton, you might love him or hate him, uh, it was time for Jack Charlton to go, but the way that that was dealt with, uh, they called him over here for a press conference, and then all of a sudden we want you to go it was very uh, underhanded you know and that you was think really it was shabby yeah well he, he was the guy who created most of the money for them um, indirectly if you look at it in the sense that uh, it was the success he had bred uh, had created all the money for them and um, re really like it was a very uh, shabby treatment and uh, obviously like we're left now in the farcical situation with one man remaining you know and yeah. I reckon the knives obviously will be sharpened. For, well, for I imagine man, you know? there'll be many, many a knife sharpened for many a person over the next uh, while. But it will be interesting to see what happens. Uh, wh oh, can I just say to you, what, what do you think should should happen now? Well, I, obviously, I think there should be a complete uh, clear out. And obviously, the FAI Council of the, the 52 members, they obviously have some, like the people who are involved there, obviously have some notion of, of what's going on uh, interior wise you know they know obviously know what rumour is true and which one is false you know yeah. and maybe it should be all tossed up like some people have said uh, well I'm available for 
uh, re-election. Obviously, I've done no harm, but uh, like let that be thrown up to the people. Like these are obviously the people who are going to re-elect uh, these people. But let, let, let's like I, I stated before, like there are an awful lot of decent people uh, running leagues around the country uh, doing it, yeah. you know, uh, on their own time. And and really, I, I'm sure they can obviously pull a hatful, a few of those people out to, to run the thing properly. Yeah, and would you accept that there have to be more professional staff rather um, than part-time work and so on and so forth? Well, obviously, I, I don't agree with the thing that they're not pro some of them are professional. Uh, these are well-minded businessmen. They might not be uh, well-minded in, in all the, the theories of football and how to run a football business, that this is new. Maybe uh, it is needed one or two uh, outsiders to be brought in uh, of, uh, you might say, a marketing mentality uh, to, to get the thing and run it properly. But obviously, uh, the way, like, there's no smoke without fire, and there obviously has been a, a large amount of uh, dishonesty um, within, you know, uh, with all the innuendos being thrown around over the thousands missing here and there. Yeah, <clears throat> well, there has been a lot of innuendo, and it always has to be remembered that it is only innuendo and that nothing has been proven yet. No, nothing has been proven, but, um, you know, all these uh, resignations, um, we had the, the case where various members of this, uh, the FAI executive went to... Uh, the president, Mr. O'Kane, said, uh, would you not resign him? And he didn't resign. They all tendered their resignation. So obviously there's uh, an awful lot of uh, acrimony among them. Absolutely. And that, of course, was into Liveline into the, with uh, Marion Fanouk. And that particular story will be developing as the week progresses. You're tuned to the Irish Collection, coming to you live from the RT studios of the Matthew Street in Cork. And if you're tuning our way for the first time, just to remind you that the collection, each and every morning between the hours of 2 o'clock and 6 o'clock, bring you highlights from the daily services from the RT radio uh, output. And also dipping into uh, music uh, between the hour of 4 and 5. And then we have our feature hour between five and six. Johnny Carroll is used to the Irish collection by now. Good morning to you, Johnny. He was in a phone coin box in Donegal. Himself and Brendan Grace were in Derry last night and both are on their way home. Uh, safe journey. They're also enjoying the show. Look forward to their forthcoming trip to Cork when they'll be playing for a week in the Opera House from the 24th of March. Well, that's the plug-in for the gig. Safe home, Johnny. Thanks for calling. 1850 888 999. And you think you'd know the stars by now. You, you, you think that, yeah, he's a nice guy. He's okay. He's one of our own. Apparently, Cliff Richard is not what he seems. I just was making a comment yesterday morning that last uh, Friday week, mm -hmm. I travelled to London on the British Airways flight to Gatwick. Mm -hmm. I turned around and standing beside me was this famous Cliff Richard, whom I had idolised, gone to all his concerts. Who has just sold two million three hundred and five thousand pounds worth of tickets for his uh, show Wuthering Heights? Oh Jeez. dear! If I had to do with that, I wouldn't have been so old. <laughs> Would you not know? He was standing beside me, Jerry, and uh, I just uh, there was nobody there. There were three or four people. There were not many on the flight. The delightful, the gorgeous, the wonderful, the magnificent, wonderful, the magnificent, the chirpy, the, the friendly, the Peter Pan esque Cliff Richard. I would prefer to use the word Christian, supposedly. Christian supposedly. But he turned around and I asked him, would he mind signing an autograph? Uh, like, they had nothing else to do because we were being delayed for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And he had a rucksack on his back. He had a rucksack on his back? A rucksack, just a little tiny on one shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, and he turned around and he said, um, now you know, I apologised because uh, I said to him that I, I didn't like interrupting him or disturbing him. And would he mind giving me naming the two children? And he just, I handed him my, my file of facts, actually, and uh, he, the next thing is he turned around and he wrote, and now you know, he says, why we hide away up in the VIP lounge, he said, for as long as possible. And it is quite obvious, he said, that I came down too early today. So that was fine. I just, uh, I don't know why I can't. When you give him a dig. I know, I should have given him a kick. Or a headbutt. But, yeah, he's Irish businesswoman in club class heads but old person Cliff Richard. No, one <laughs> one one line past this. <laughs> that would be lovely. That would be lovely. And the next thing he happened was uh, it, I didn't mind me, mm. but there was this just ordinary, ordinary Irish guy and his partner, be she his wife or friend, whoever, and they were so excited. They would have been young now that have been about in their 20s, 25 to 30 age. And they got excited by the sight of Sir Cliff, didn't they? Cliff Richard, yes. Mm. And he just walked down briskly past me and he said to, to, to Cliff, with a little piece of paper and a spiral in his hand, yeah. and handed it to Cliff Richard. And he got exactly the same treatment. 
he was told, the same as I was, now you know why I will stay up in the VIP. It seemed as if it was a recording coming out all over again. And uh, it quite obviously we came down, I came down too early this time. And when the third one approached him, he lost his cool altogether. He turned around and he said to the poor man, he says, not again, not again. And he just signed something quickly on a piece of paper and he walked away. Could maybe PMT. Well, if, if, I think he's could probably uh, a little bit past the menopause, but um, <laughs> that was what was struck me at. <laughs> well, here's a man in defence of Cliff. Hey, yeah. good morning to Alan. Alan, good morning. Good morning, Alan. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning. Morning. I only picked uh, Cliff up there. I drive a cab around Dublin, you know, and I picked him up oh, about, about two years ago from, uh, I don't know if I say, Patrick Gibbo was there in James's place. Oh, the chipper, yeah. The chipper there, yeah. yeah you get a nice smoke cotton down in it, you know. <laughs> and uh, we had him on a bram around to the to Westbury, and I have to say, it was all right. Nice bloke. I asked him for the autograph for me mother. I let him was for the mother. It was just that proof that I had him in the car, really, you know. Yeah, why do people actually do that when they're actually uh, when they're asking for autographs? I have spent a lot of my life with a uh, oh, we have one sign of this. It's not for me. I think you're crap. But uh, my sister likes you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I do. Do I? don't know. It's just one of those things. Anyway, so he was nice.